After the controversial but essential budget allocation, my second political mission is to bring this dilapidated country a new and democratic constitution. The Seoul constitution is old and out of date, while giving too much ground for possible authoritarian regime and hindrance to the real democracy. There are several issues under the constant debate. First, the veto power of the president. The whole legislature unanimously support the removal of this special right. Secondly, the ban of judicial review, which enables the Supreme Court to vote and have a say on the legislation. The Parliament is also on the complete same page on this issue. Third, the majority of members of Parliament wants the Parliament to be able to appoint the cabinet minister, being either direct or indirect. Fourth. Many MPs want to remove the member of honor status of the former president So, which gives him permanent immunity and a seat in the parliament. This is supported by mostly the radical wing, while most conservatives are not keen on it. In general, most of the rewriting of the constitution is about enhancing the power of parliament while limiting the power of the president and the judicial court. Surely it would somehow shrink my power, but it is my commitment to the country and a big step forward on the path of democratization of our country. So there is no way to put my personal laws over the national gain. There are 250 seats in our parliament. 130 belong to the USP Party. 70 belong to the Reformist Democratic Party. 40 belong to the Conservative Party, and 10 are independent members. To pass a legislation, two thirds of the parliament should be stand with us. In other words, we need a total of 167 seats. To reach the goal, I need the support from both my own party and the Reformist Democratic Party. In my own USP Party. There are many disagreements over the constitution reform. The conservative wing, led by the speaker Tory, would surely be somehow disappointed in my proposal and hard to convince. While the reformist wing should be a lot easier. On the other hand, the Democratic Party is too radical in some issues, which is not realistic in the current stage. So my job is to find a common ground for most of them to agree on, or compromise. Cannot be too radical, but. Board changes must be made. It is definitely a tough decision. The first key people I approach is the leader of radical wing in our USP party. He is probably the easiest one to tackle. On the one hand, he is a USP party member, so he is radically supposed to give me his loyalty and support. On the other hand, most of my proposals are to his appetite, as being change but not that aggressive. Then I approached the leader of the Democratic Party. He was a successful businessman before deciding to campaign for a position in the parliament, and became the leader of the newly formed Democratic Party. Some say he is a populist. Even my chief of staff Lucien warned me that he might be my biggest challenger in the next election, in light of the fast rise of his Democratic Party. But at least now, I have to focus on the constitution reform, and therefore I need his support desperately. Surprisingly, he didn't directly tell me whether he supported the proposal or not, but invited me to a friendly party. I really don't want to participate in this fishy party, but as I said, I have no choice but to seek for their cooperation, even if I know it's a poison spade. I have to swallow it. And it later turned out that the party is anything but friendly. It was a luxurious one organized by a bunch of richest people in our country. A lot of them are the patrons of the Democratic Party. After the party, one of the biggest capitalists in Scotland, Mr. Chair, asked me to stay for a drink, and then he directly told me his conditions. He said he could convince members of the Democratic Party to give me most votes I need, but in return, I have to promise him a big tax cut for the large corporations and privatization of both the healthcare and the education industry. To be honest, I expect that the support would never be free, but the real price still shocked me. During the severe national stringency, if I give a tax break to large corporations, it would only drain the government reserve more and make the situation worse. Not to mention the resentment from the already disappointed public. On the other hand, healthcare and education are two key areas directly affecting the social welfare. In this area, most economists and even politicians, regardless ideology, all believe that such key areas should be in the hand of the government. 
Although some economists suggest that privatization of them would save a lot of money and then increase the quality of service, there is indubitably that the economic inequality would be drastically increased. When schools and hospitals become private, they will simultaneously become profit-driven. Though some people with enough financial ability could enjoy higher quality service, but most majority of the poor population would be even denied access to the facilities. Moreover, the effort could be invisible as it's almost impossible to renationalize those areas due to the endless legal, financial and other troubles. But if I reject his offer, I would simply fail my constitution reform, which would humiliate me and my administration further destabilize the regime. Politics is about compromise and consensus is hardly the point. After all, I don't have choice. But I also tried my best to bargain that I asked for his help from the media industry. I knew he is the boss of most influential newspaper companies in our country and a positive image from the media would make a lot of things easier. And then the deal was made. It was bitter. After the night, I clearly felt the change. I have become a real politician, I told myself. Some people say politicians are moral vacuum. I can hardly disagree. But I tried my very best to tell myself that at least I made those decisions for the good of the nation, especially in the long run. I believe I am fundamentally different from other politicians. At least I have my principles. At least I believe so. Then, the third meeting with, is with the leader of the conservative wing of our USB party, Madame Tory, who is also the speaker of USB party in the parliament. Our talk was in her parliamentary office, which is quite formal. He directly told me that he is not supportive of my proposals. She believed in the necessity of change, but she is more confident in the time-honored traditions, like those policies and legislatures from the Seoul presidency. I was not surprised at her reaction at all, and I was also very direct, giving her my offer, to give her support from for my pres proposal. I would give positive feedback for many issues the conservative wing were interested. For example, I would not lower the threshold of political party entering the parliament, which is strongly desired by most opposition parties. I would immediately vote veto several proposals from the reformists, such as the proposal to allow language other than our Swedish to be used for school teaching and religious ceremonies, and the proposal to allow trade unions to organize protests without seeking governmental permit in advance. Some of these proposals are from our own USB party but from the other wing, while some come from the Democratic Party. But I am sure that the speaker would not be able to turn down this lucrative offer directly from the president. But still to my surprise, she added one more condition, that is to cancel my wife's public speech during an incoming festival celebration, which was to encourage feminism in our still largely conservative society. I was furious as I thought she was trying to make fun of me. She was asking me to withdraw my support for my wife, but her response was utterly unexpected. She told me that as a woman herself, she was more than ardent to promote gender equality, but as a politician, she was also deeply aware of the unfavorable status quo that most national leadership positions are occupied by males, and even the constitution is not protecting certain gender rights. Thus, a public feminism speech by the president's wife would only irritate those old patriarchists and screw everything up. In her opinion, it is not the time yet. I was silent for a long while as she completely changed my perception and attitudes towards politicians. People favor the black and white situation and prefer to give people oversimplified labels like good and bad, but the reality is much more complicated than that. The deal was made with her eventually, and I had a firm handshake with her before I left. As many said, parliament debate solves nothing and everything is solved before the actual debate. After all these conversations and deals, the actual parliament voting is much more smooth. Even though at the end of the voting, the old president so appeared in the hall, he still couldn't change anything. He was a top politician of his time, but only a retired old man now. It is true that there are still people following his ideology and fight for the cause he advocates, but the helm is held by us, not by them. But I was also wondering, what will happen after my retirement from politics? Would my efforts also be overturned like those? No one knows, but 
Somehow I don't really care. The success in parliament is stunning and shocking to many others, and according to the plan, the media also made their contribution. Under the overwhelming pressure from both public and the all winds of politics, the constitution of proposal passed the Supreme Court with a close 6-5 to five vote, eventually the sole area ended. However, the final version of the constitution is a big different from the initial proposal. Firstly, the presidential veto is partially removed as now the parliament could overturn the veto by a 75% supermajority. Secondly, the judicial review is completely removed. Supreme Court could no longer veto on any legislation. Thirdly, the parliament could now give the confidence vote on the president's nomination of cabinet ministers. Fourthly, a term limit is set up. Each term is four years and one can only serve the at most two terms as the president of Solent. Fifth, a retired president can no longer become can become a member of honor, but the title is only titular now. In other words, he can no longer enjoy permanent judicial immunity or holding a permanent position in the parliament. It is a great success for me politically, and everyone was congratulating me for making such a significant move at the first term of being president. My support rate was also historically high, but only I knew what I had lost or compromised for this so-called success. I don't know whether it was it, I don't know whether I will regret it in the future, but I know one thing for sure, that is there is no way for me to turn back anymore.